if you haven't met me, I'm an assistant professor in social and uh, I supervise MA students uh, among the whole rest of us. And today's workshop is about statistical power. This is a point that's, uh, um, I think, ignored in many theses and indeed ignored even in many of the published research articles that you have based your thesis work on. However, I think it's critical and underappreciated, and it is a route to two things that uh, you might value. One, doing a higher quality project that is more useful science, and two, uh, maybe getting a higher mark. So we're going to be pursuing it for those main goals. Let's go ahead and get started. So. One of the reasons why I became really interested in power was this replication challenge that I mentioned in my open science workshop. Um, and there were a number of, uh, of key findings that I had been taught as facts when I did my PhD that uh, turned out not to be facts and the other labs couldn't reproduce them. And there were quite a lot of them, here's a couple, but um, it wasn't clear all of a sudden what was true and what wasn't. And one of the solutions to that is radical transparency, openness with materials, code, data, uh, you know, pre-registration, analytic plans, that sort of thing. Another half of that that we haven't talked about yet is power. Throughout today's uh, workshop, uh, well, it's not, it's more of a lecture than a workshop. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat. I have that open here and I can see it. I uh, would uh, not mind at all that interruption. So feel free to interrupt anytime. So false uh, power is a major contributor to false positive results in the literature. That is where someone claims that they have found an, an effect um, in particular surprising or novel effects that are surprising uh, to someone who um, you know knows something about the area that that's a real red flag. And uh, one of the reasons those things happen is not because the researchers have made any kind of, you know, bad decision uh, about, uh, I mean, they're not doing fraud necessarily. Um, it's much more common that they're just not looking at the, at their ability to detect a true effect given um, the parameters of their design. Another one of the challenges that comes up with power that's similar to the uh, open science transparency stuff I was talking about last time is short versus long term needs. If you do this all up front, it takes more time, yeah, to plan it properly. But then you don't spend four months doing a project that was never powered to detect a, a real effect anyway. And so in the long run, I, I think it has saved me a lot of time because it constrains the questions and designs that are actually going to lead me to statistical tests that are useful for me and for others. In the short term, it does cost a little more time. My personal experience is that when I first learned about all this, I found it totally horrifying. And that might be your experience today too, I don't know. But uh, in the long run, I have found it freeing because it uh, gives me a, a, well, it gives me a good explanation for why things are happening the way that they are. So. Why should you care? Do you want to spend uh, your whole project working on a on a false result? You know, what if you then turn around and advertise that result to the next people you're trying to get a job from? You want to make sure that this is real solid science, even if that means working on a slightly different statistical design. The short versus long term thing is a little bit tricky, and we'll talk about this later. But not everyone's supervisor is. Uh, interested or skilled in talking about power analysis and planning for certain designs. And so part of this is your responsibility as more advanced students to now educate your supervisors as well. Now that's a give and take. They, of course, you wanna to check to see that they're interested and you wanna find a good compromise that works for both of you. I'm not telling you to go uh, tell your supervisor what type of design they should approve, um, but it is actually totally okay to um, feed information upwards and, uh, and, you know, improve our training in, and mine as well. I find it freeing in part because the alternative, not, uh, not 
looking at power means I have less ability to explain why things are happening. And it's confusing when you run a study and you find an effect and then you run another study and you don't find the effect and you don't have any idea why. So this is the, uh, the sort of famous two by two here about uh, types of statistical errors. And you have thought about this a lot, probably with regard to your self tests lately. You know, uh, the null hypothesis here is actually true. So that means that uh, there, let's say you, uh, you don't have uh, corona, that might be a true null hypothesis. Then uh, if you accept H0, that's your, uh, you know, if you showed a negative result, then that's correct. But if you reject H0, let's say you showed a positive result, then that would be a false positive, also called a type one error. And equally on the other column, you can see there's one correct and one is a mistake. And that mistake on the other side is a false negative or type two error. This is basically the whole thing that power is looking at. Another way to show the same information is to look at it in terms of distributions. This is a bit much all at once, but let me walk you through it. Let's say we have two groups and we're trying to test the difference between them. Let's say our question, our question, a research question is, uh, are men taller than women on average? Null hypothesis over here, let's say, is our distribution for women and their height. And we say, okay, uh, if the male distribution in red is uh, the same as the blue distribution, then uh, we're going to conclude that there's no difference in height. But in fact, um, the, the observed distribution for men is higher in this case. And so then you draw a line over some critical value, depending on your alpha, uh, you know, and what the alpha does is it moves this vertical line left and right to change the ratio of type one to type two errors. So what, what's happening is you're exchanging more false positives for fewer false negatives or vice versa, depending on where you want your alpha. And that's why there's no correct decision for alpha and there's nothing magical about 0.05. It's just a standard that we've all gotten quite used to. But I'll show you in a minute why 0.05 is maybe a little bit more dangerous than you might have realized. A quick, uh, a quick note here about these two distributions. This would never be for height between men and women. Those two distributions would be heavily overlapping. These are uh, almost totally separated. And you'll find very few effects in psychology of this magnitude, certainly social psychology. Another angle to think about is doing simulation. So now uh, this didn't used to be well known, but now it's well known. Um, if you look at the type of uh, uh, you know test you're doing and how many observations you have, let's say it's a between subjects experiment where you randomize some people to this you know, uh, condition and you randomize other people to another condition and um, you have, I don't know, 50 in each condition. So let's say you have 100 people. How big the effect is, how big the difference is between the groups affects uh, how likely you are to uh, observe the true effect if it is true. So that is what power is, is, uh, is if you go back to the table we saw earlier, if H0 is false, if there is an effect, how likely are we to reject H0? That's what power is. So if here, if it says, let's say, um, you know, the, the power on the y-axis here is 0.8, that's 80%. That means 80% of the time there is a true effect, you're going to detect it. That's, I mean, that's not great. It's only four out of five. And so sometimes we power our studies even higher than 80%. But if you look and you look at this graph for 80%, um, almost none of these lines cross over it. Basically, uh, if you have fewer than 100 people, a lot of the tests you're going to run don't even have 80% power to detect some difference. And these Ds uh, for the three lines are different effect sizes. And let me tell you, the one that is most similar to most of your effects is the D of 0.2, meaning that you have a small effect you're looking for in the data. You have 100 people, you're only at like 25% power, which means you have a quarter of a chance to detect it, even if it were true. 
which makes it very hard to interpret the meaning of the study in the end if you didn't find an effect or if you did. We'll come back to that in a second. Registered, <clears throat> registered report, which I mentioned in my last workshop, often require 95% power for their critical test. 80% is typical in most other articles. You should consider in your specific research question, what sort of size effects are typical in this literature for that kind of thing I'm looking for? I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest to you that for most of you, that's gonna be the green line, but you should find out because that affects how large your sample needs to be to test certain kinds of designs to get a high powered result. And let me say up front, not every thesis needs to have high power because you don't have the resources. We totally understand that. We don't penalize you for um, you know, making sure that your sample has high power. That said, it should affect what kinds of questions you ask and what designs you select. There's something that really shocked me about power when I was learning about it from uh, Daniel Lockins, uh, and uh, this is it. When the null hypothesis is true, p-values are uniformly distributed. This is the result of a big simulation. And so you can see in red, the count of getting different types of p-values from zero to one. If the null hypothesis is true, there's no effect. They're all over the place. I think intuitively many researchers and students expect that if there's no effect, that the p-values will all be large, but no, they're uniformly distributed, which means that uh, 5% of the time, you're going to get them lower than 0.05 when the null hypothesis is true. Now, when the alternative hypothesis is true, when there is a true effect to be discovered and power is high, p-values are generally very low. That means that if you have a well-powered study and the, and the alternative hypothesis is true, you're gonna almost certainly get a pretty small p-value. What's very interesting about this result is that it means that when you get p-values close to 0.05, which I do not consider very low, and you know that your power wasn't very good, it, be, it can become more likely that you have a false positive than a true effect because you know about what level power you had. So, that's the uh, conceptual overview part. Now I'm gonna talk through some examples and this is a good place for you to ask questions or ask me to slow down in the chat, please. So the main type of power analysis called an a priori power, power analysis, it means doing it in advance. So you do this before you collect your data and ideally it affects what kind of design you select. There's four components, the effect size, you saw that earlier, bigger effects get more power, um, even with the same size sample, okay? Alpha, uh, smaller alphas uh, make it harder to detect an effect, uh, but they minimize your false positives, which is a huge benefit. There's power, and then there's sample size. More is better in general. Now, what's cool about these is uh, it's, they're all sort of uh, linked to each other. So as soon as you know three of them, you can figure out the fourth one. And that helps you answer different questions, which we'll talk about. But in, in, in the a priori power analysis, you usually are asking, uh, what is the sample size I need to detect this size effect given this alpha at that level of power? And then it'll give you the sample size. So for example, for a priming experiment with two experimental conditions, we use a between subjects experiment. And we're gonna do it, you know, a, a, a two sample t-test. What sample size do we need? You can do these kinds of calculations in R and I'll show you the code today, but you can also do them in G power, which is a, a free uh, application you can download. And uh, I will show you a bit of uh, screenshots from G power in a minute. So here it is in R first. There's a bunch of packages that do this, but I have uh, introduced it to you with this one, PWR. So first you have to tell R to install the package. You only do that once. Then if you wanna use the package at a certain day, you call the library and then you would run this test. And this function says power t-test, 
the N is blank because that's the one we want. We provide the other three details here. I'll walk through them. And then you press enter and it just does it. It's instantaneous because the math is very simple. Here's our effect, the D of 0.3. That's a little bit ambitious, frankly. That's slightly large depending on the area. This is our alpha, the significance level. The required power, 0.8, to remind you, means 80%, which means if the effect is real, we have an 80% chance of detecting it. That's, that's not great, but it's pretty good. And then type two sample, this is the type of t-test. And it will spit back something that looks a bit like this. It says N of 176 in each group for that level effect size, for that alpha, for that power. And so the required N is two of those groups. So for these inputs, you will need 352 people for 80% power. Now, right away, the first feeling is I can't recruit that many people. And yeah, you might not be able to. And that is okay, like uh, because you're not most of you running something that is going to be published in a leading international journal. You don't need to have everything you do be very powered, but it should affect how you think about the design and your interpretation when you get there, particularly of null results. This is what that same screen would look like in GPower in that downloading application, you select a test family in the upper left, t-tests, then which statistical tests? Okay, the means difference, two independent means. Type of power analysis, I told you this is a priori and it explains, then you put in the features and tells you what it is over here. And reassuringly, we get the exact same answer in GPower that we got out of R. That's how to do this. And you can run a bunch of different types of designs. Most of them will be all main effects. We'll talk about moderation level later. <clears throat> this is what the power diagram looks like for the effect I just mentioned, uh, 0.3. And you can see the relative uh, likelihood of the uh, false positive and uh, false negative here. But is 0.3 realistic for your study, given your literature? You'll have to uh, see if it is. For some of you, it will be an overestimate which means you would need even more people to have that love, same level of power. Okay, that was the end of a, uh, our first uh, example. I'm gonna move on to a few more, but um, do pause if you wanna chat about anything. Uh, pause me by raising your hand or, or talking in the chat. Okay. Another type of power analysis you might want to do is called a sensitivity analysis. These are often run after you know how many people were in the study. So maybe you've already run the study and you wanna know how well powered was that study that was just run? I can't increase it now, but I'd like to know, yeah, what sort of power was achieved? It, is, it doesn't make sense to decide uh, like what kind of effect you want to power your study for after it's been run. So we don't solve for, uh, you can't solve for sample size anymore. Now you have to solve for power. So it's just the same sort of math, but you input a different feature here. You tell our, okay, given we collected uh, 90 people in each group, so 180 total, given a, a, an effect size of 0.3 and an alpha of 0.05, tell me what the power is. And it will come back and say, your power was about 52%. So coin flip, if you run this study once and you do or do not find an effect, you had a one half chance of not finding it if it was real. So it's a bit of a coin flip. Let's do another one. Now this one is gonna change format a bit. Instead of being between subjects, it's gonna be within subjects. So let's say that we have two time points for each person before and after some treatment. Now, if it's a t-test within subjects, what end do we need? We're gonna use the same code before. Okay, power t-test. Now you know this n is per group. We're gonna look at this effect size, uh, this significance level, this power. What is the answer now? Now it says, okay, you need 90 in each group. Well, that's kind of interesting because this says, okay, you for a within subjects power analysis, you only need 180 people. 
And we just got the answer that for 80% power between subjects, you need 350 people, twice as many. Does anyone know why the within subjects designs have more power? I'm going to pause and wait for you to write that in the chat or speak up. Any guesses? Come on, let's make this more interactive. Maybe because of the individual differences. So in a within, you don't have to, you know, cal cal calculate that in, and the individual differences might be, you know, explaining some of the results. That is exactly right. So let's back up, and we can say there's variance that has to be explained. And if you use a between subjects study, you also have to explain the, the variance in individual differences that might have nothing to do with your particular research question, but that is nonetheless affecting the outcome within the level of the individual. And so when you account for that in a within subjects test, then you get a lot better power. Yeah, exactly right. Thanks. Um, in practice, this means that uh, we should be selecting uh, these within subjects designs wherever possible, because it makes it easier for us to detect the small effects that are typical within social psych. Another common thing that we like to do is run a correlation, and uh, there's some good evidence recently that uh, correlations can bounce around a lot if you have small sample size. They stabilize at about 250. So for again, for journal level quality, 250 is, I think, a good beginner level for uh, running correlations. But let's run it through our power analysis, because you can do a power analysis for any type of statistical test, including this one. So let's say Pearson's R, and we say, how many people do I need to get a correlation of 0.3 at an alpha of 0.05 at 80% power? And the answer is 85 people. So if you are looking for a correlation that's lower than 0.3, you don't have good power to detect it uh, in a sample smaller than 85 people. And many of our correlations are smaller than 0.3. So it's a word of caution here. And let's do that backwards now. We can do the sensitivity analysis after running it. Let's say we collected 250 people because we were able to combine with another master's student and we, we got 250, let's say. Okay, what sort of correlation could I detect given an alpha of 0.05 power of 80%? And it says, ah, you can detect down to about 8.18 with 80% power. So, this is useful because whatever the results you found, you know, uh, you have a sense of whether they are believable or not from what power you had to detect that result. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about um, some more complicated designs, but the quick answer about more complicated designs is that you can, you don't, uh, we don't have easy tools to calculate the power needed for those kinds of Designs, they require more participants. And since the main effects are already somewhat difficult for us to power, uh, caution with complex designs. Now here, this is a mediation with two mediators. We have the predictor variable uh, um, uh, X, mediator one, mediator two, predicting some outcome Y. Uh, calculating power for these uh, is a bit challenging, and I, we won't be expecting you to do that for your thesis. If you have mediation, you, you don't need to do a proper power analysis for the indirect effect. But what you could do is model one of the direct paths. For example, this relationship between X and M1, let's say you did a power analysis for that path, and you said, here's a plausible effect size given previous literature. Here's about the uh, sample size, you know, we're expecting alpha 0.05, uh, 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 you know, uh, whatever. You can solve for the fourth one, whether you're more interested in looking at the effect detectable or the power or the sample size, and you can get a sense of this. Now, whatever you get for this, the testing for the indirect effect in this more complex model will be harder. That is to say more people required. So if you get an answer that you don't, you know, you aren't well powered for this, then you probably aren't well powered to do the more complex model. And so that is a, you can always scaffold down to some simpler analysis 
and get a sense of how you're doing. Now, moderation is not uh, recommended between subjects. And that's sad because almost all of the moderation research questions in social are between subjects about individual differences as, uh, as was mentioned a minute ago. Why is this so difficult? Uh, I mean, why is it so difficult to power properly? Here's a scatter plot, you know, between two variables. But what you can see is either vertically or horizontally, most people are mostly in the middle. And that's why we get a, uh, a normal distribution, right? There's more people in the middle of whatever variable. Given that, the estimates about variance and the error is lowest in the middle. And you can see that in this graph, that we have this 95% uh, confidence interval uh, in gray, and it's skinniest in the middle, which means we have higher precision, lower error in the middle where we have the most data. Yeah, it makes total sense, right? But what is an interaction? It's basically where you're testing at the extremes. You're looking at the far left and the far right. Are these things different? That's where we have the least data. And so because of that, it's a lot harder to detect uh, interaction effects than it is main effects. A second issue is that uh, this interaction I've showed you is fully crossover, like that is, uh, you know, green has got no effect and then blue is negative. Uh, but most interactions are attenuating, like uh, there's no, there's some effect and then it's stronger or weaker in this group. Like uh, you can think of it like a crocodile. It's bigger or smaller, but it doesn't fully turn into an X. Most of our moderations are attenuating. Those are even harder, about twice as hard to detect because there's less variance. You can always think back to, okay, what's varying and what are our chances for finding it? And in some, you need eight to 16 times the sample size to estimate an interaction than a main effect. And if our main effects are already taking three, 400 people to detect, you better believe we never have sufficient power in a master's thesis uh, never, not never, but not if you're collecting your own data, it's extremely rare that you would have enough power to detect a moderating hypothesis with good power. Now, that doesn't mean you can never do a moderation. You could run one, but in at least in my group, I would want to see in your discussion that you understood that it wasn't well powered and what that meant for the interpretation. Those are two blogs that I really like on this topic easy to understand. I could have just sent you to a paper that explains it, but I think, I think these blogs are even easier to read. So those are the ones I recommend. Um, the, the slides are already up on the, uh, in the module. And uh, last note of caution here, what is the interaction effect size? Like, should we use the same 0.3 that we used earlier? There's often not very much literature to say what the interaction is. We like, maybe we're testing it for the first time and mostly interaction effects are smaller than main effects. So that increases the required sample size even further. What about mediated moderation, moderation, moderated mediation, et cetera? Those are even harder. So if your research question requires these, I recommend you use large pre-existing data. For example, this list of open psychological data sets. And I have run uh, both uh, bachelor's and master's theses using pre existing secondary data. Some of these data sets have, yeah, like 10,000, 40,000 people. Then you can test these kinds of designs with good power. Okay, a few closing thoughts. Then I will uh, ask you for questions and hopefully we can have a bit of a QA because I'm almost done. These power analyses that I've showed you today look dire maybe, but they are optimistic because they assume that your variables are normally distributed, that you have no ceiling effects, no floor effects, no you know shocking outliers, no terrible skew, and those kinds of things are normal to find. So in practice, you'll need a larger number than the number of the uh, test outputs. You might ask, and you're welcome to ask me in Q&A, what about all the literature we've read that didn't present a power analysis and had smaller amounts of people uh, and, and tested the kinds of designs that you're saying aren't possible to test? 
it's not that it's not possible. It's just that if you ran a low power study, like let's say you have, I don't know, I would say the literature has maybe 30% power on average. I think that's fair. What if you ran a study that had a 30% chance of working and then you found the result you were looking for and then you wrote it up and you got a big paper? I mean, basically you're saying to the reader, you got lucky because we know that your design wasn't capable of detecting the effect 70% of the time, even if it was really there at that effect size. So a lot of those literature are false, basically. We just don't know which ones. What about if my supervisor doesn't have an issue with power and never talks to me about power and uh, recommended me a design that you're saying has low power? I would say, this is uh, this is worth a conversation. Uh, you should come to a compromise with your advisor. My preferred solution would be that you both talk through this and then interpret whatever you've done, including power. But some supervisors don't uh, yet include this. It's not a like a, a core issue mentioned in the manual, for example. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not that all of you need to get deep into this, but I think it is a route to understanding your research question and design better, picking something that's more likely to come out with a result um, that, rather than a null finding. Not that null findings are bad, just that uh, they're a little bit less fun. And when should you use power analysis? It's appropriate for key confirmatory tests that like an, in an experiment saying this group will have higher Y than that group. If you're doing a big, uh, yeah, like very descriptive, very exploratory study, that's unusual for master's thesis. But if you were, yeah, you might not need a power analysis or not need it for all kinds of tests just to get a broad sense of your sample. You can, of course, in a study where you powered one test, you could run other things. But if you didn't do a power analysis up front for all those other things, you just have to look at those results with a little bit more caution. So what can you do when power is insufficient and you can't recruit that many people? And this is almost everyone in master's thesis land. You can adjust your alpha. That is actually allowed. You may, you can say, look, we don't have a lot of power. So we're going to use a less stringent alpha to improve the power a bit. And it's going to be you know, more likely that we get a false positive because of that. Fine, but at least you'll have better power to detect effect given those parameters. There's no use using a tiny alpha if you end up with tiny power. You can choose a one-tailed versus two-tailed test that helps by a factor of two if you expect one group to really be higher than the other. You can look at different kinds of effect sizes, justify them differently. You know, this doesn't mean change the effect size until it fits the output that you want, but feel free to think about effect sizes and, and, uh, and which literatures you're borrowing from and, uh, and choose predictors that make sense for that effect size. Or you could change your design. And the most common thing that happens with my supervisions is uh, I advise people not to do moderation and to do mediation less often. Here's a paper I like about justifying an effect size. He's, he, he talks about uh, smallest effect size of interest as the thing that we should be powering our studies for, but that, you know, that might require more people. And anyway, there's some language there about why you would argue that your effect size you selected for your power analysis is appropriate. Last, if you end up doing any of this in R, it is pretty easy. You don't have to learn how to use R. You could just plug in exactly what I wrote and it would work. Um, and uh, even if you did that, uh, R has a nice online community. I find them quite supportive and you can ask questions and uh, it's good. You can also ask me questions, I don't mind. This last slide, you don't have to read. I'm just including it because I wanted to give you an example of what it looks like in the write-up. This is from one of my recently published papers. Um, and it's how I talked about the power analysis and sample size of the study. So this appeared in the method section, right when I was talking about the design. And at the bottom there, one more time, just one of the blogs about uh, why interactions take too many, too many people. That is it. And I would love to uh, have any questions or 
comments now from you. What are you working on? Um, what are your questions about how to approach this with your supervisor? What, uh, what didn't I explain that you'd like to hear more about next time and that sort of thing? I was wondering, is there, um, is it better to use R over J power or the other way around or does it not matter? It doesn't much matter. Uh, if you're not at all familiar with programming, R will be maybe not worth the time. But if you can put in a couple commands into a command line, I think it's actually easier than GPower. Okay. Uh, and do you have to like, because with GPower, you have to specify whether it's a priori or a post hoc. Do you have to do that with the R package as well? or? No. With the R package, what you do is you just put in the three features that you have and it will give you the fourth one, but it won't explain anything to you about what this means. So a little bit less uh, uh, less of that language like a priori or uh, sensitivity, et cetera, that you'll get in GPower. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, so I think I have quite a complex model. It's a parallel mediation model. And I was looking at, at the literature and I found the um, Monte Carlo power analysis. Um, and I actually found like quite an intuitive cal calculator online. Oh, great. Okay. Oh, please, so, please share it and I can, uh, I can send it to the others too. Yeah. Okay. Because then you said that if I have a complex model, I should just like look at main effects. But if I have this calculate, cal calculator, then it's like, okay to do that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't seen that. I would be fine if one of my students went, out, went ahead and found such a tool and used it. That sounds positive to me. Okay. And that's what you suggest, like that's the best solution for parallel mediation models, right? I mean, if it is specifically for that kind of design, it sounds the most appropriate. Okay. I can't, I can't say offhand because of course, I don't know if this is a tool that's been accepted by other scientists or if it's just something someone whipped up or is there a paper on it, et cetera, et cetera. But it sounds very positive and I think that's the one you should use. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Monte Carlo uh, 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 simulation is just one type of way people are testing sort of through brute force, whether a certain design would have a certain amount of power. Uh, you know, you just run it a thousand times and, and with a certain effect size, and then it spits out how, what your likely power is. So that's what a lot of the complex designs are under the hood. They're doing Monte Carlo simulation. I have a question about the um, within subject design that you described earlier in the test. Um, when you say it tells you the number for one group, I was a bit mm -hmm. confused at that moment because obviously with, within um, the science, you usually have all the subjects doing the same test, basically. You don't have necessarily different groups, I thought. Or are you talking about a control group or what exactly are the groups in there? Well done. Yeah, no, I think I, I think I made a mistake when I was describing that. Sorry. So per group there just means per assessment point. So if it was 80 or whatever it was, then that means 80 participants, but 160 observations. Uh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that's clear next time. I'll, I'll make a note of that. Thanks. Any other questions from the group or uh, or comments about what you're working on specifically? Well, if not, I welcome you to contact me about this. I think it's part of my service to the department that I can just share. I know a little bit more about this than some of the other people working because uh, I've did a little bit more recent training specifically in this area. Um, feel free to come to me with your questions and I'll do my best and, uh, and best of luck with your master's thesis, whatever the amount of power you have, you can always write about it, you know, with subtlety and with, uh, good expertise and good awareness in your discussion. So it's not that we require you to have high power. Uh, and in my group, I don't, I just want them to interpret the effects and the absence of effects in light of how much power there was. And with that, thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.